All right, so um, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Millie's Guide to All Things Oxbridge. So whether you're watching live or watching the recording on YouTube, uh, thank you so much for taking some time to watch what I know will be a very insightful and interesting panel. Um, my name is Hiba, and I'm very excited to be your moderator for today. So for those of you joining a Millie panel for the first time, Millie is a company dedicated to building a community for international school students globally. Um, as an international student myself, I know that sometimes you may struggle in getting the help you want when it comes to career guidance, major selections, and university choices. So Millie is here to help you figure all of that out. Um, for this reason, Millie hosts webinars and panels such as this one on a weekly basis. And you can learn all about our past and future events at our website, www.milliegroup.com. And for more information on our events at Millie, check out our Instagram at Millie underscore group. So without any further ado, let's get started with Millie's guide to all things Oxbridge. So how this is going to work is I'm going to first ask the panelists some pre-prepared questions, but for all the audience members out there, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A chat at any time, and I'll make sure to bring them up for the panelists in the last 10 to 15 minutes or so. So I encourage you to ask questions, whether they're for a specific panelist or for everyone, I'm sure they'll all be very willing to answer any questions you may have. Um, so today we have three amazing panelists who are all either students of Oxford or Cambridge. So firstly, I'd like if you guys could introduce yourselves. So can you please uh, let us know your name, uh, what university, of course, uh, you go to, the city you are in and where you're from, and one fun fact about yourself. Uh, Susanna, we can start with you. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. My name is Susanna. Uh, I study linguistics and Portuguese at Oxford, uh, but I'm originally from Warsaw. Um, and a fun fact about me is that um, I'm a huge fan of fantasy and I used to teach myself Elvish. That's me. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Luca. I'm a master's student in Latin American studies, also at Oxford. I am originally from Italy, but yes, now I'm uh, here in England. And my fun fact is that when I was doing field work over the summer for my course in Mexico, the airline lost my luggage. And so for a whole month, I wore only one set of shirts and clothes that I washed every night. <laughs> Hi, it's great to be here. Um, I'm Malavika. I do a master's in environmental policy at Cambridge. Um, I'm from India, um, but now I'm here at Cambridge. And a fun fact about me I've never broken a bone in my body, and I don't intend to do that anytime soon. Amazing. I think I would have the same fun fact. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get into um, your academic uh, life. So first, I think the most obvious question we can start with is why did you decide to attend either Oxford or Cambridge? Was it because of the program, or is this somewhere that you specifically always wanted to go? Like, What led you to come here? Uh, so I can I can start. Uh, so uh, I was intending to actually stay in Poland uh, because I had traveled around quite a bit um, when I was younger. So I thought I might just settle down and stay where I was during high school. Uh, but Oxford had a program that I found was kind of I felt like it was tailored to me. And I thought that if there's one place where I would want to take the risk of studying abroad and going to, it would be here just because the program was worth it. And I really thought that it's a place where I can do something that I'm passionate about um, while also like going to Oxford. So I thought that would be that would be a risk worth taking. So I did. Yeah, I mean, similarly, I think for me, what made the difference was the program. Um, I really wanted to do something uh, to do with Latin America um, and there weren't very many universities offering that. Uh, so when I looked into masters uh, after I did an undergraduate in politics, which was nice, but quite broad, uh, when I was looking for masters to kind of specialize in, uh, it, it basically came down to Oxford and just a few others. And so it made sense for me to apply here. Yeah, I guess similar to the others, I um I did my undergrad at LSE in London, so I knew that for my master's I was um, leaning more towards studying in the UK. I really enjoyed my experience there, so 
um, I thought of applying to Cambridge because I really enjoyed um, my degree in environment and development and I thought I was specializing more within policy, which um, Cambridge offers just that. And I think the mix of the, the courses within like economics and law was something very unique to Cambridge's master. So, yeah. Amazing, very interesting. So what would you say your academic life is like? Do you feel like, you know, maybe for Luca and Malvika, you can answer based on your previous universities or you can answer based on, you know, your friends' experience? Like, do you feel like it is a truth that your uni is more challenging, like academically, um, or is it more of a myth? Like, what do you think the academic life is like? Zuza, we can start with you, yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm doing my bachelor still, but I've got some friends who have gone on to do their masters in different places. And one thing that is common, uh, that something that I hear from them is that they're quite uh, they're a bit more relaxed than they were here. They say that okay, I'm quite on top of my work, um, as opposed to. Uh, in Oxford, that is not to say that it's impossible to be on top of your workload, because it definitely is. But what I hear is that Oxford kind of gets you used to doing quite a lot of things every week, and you can get into a routine of submitting um, quite a lot of, um, be it in my case, translations or essays um, on a weekly basis, whereas in other uh, universities, from what I hear, it's more like project based, and you don't have that many things going on at the same time. But I'm actually quite curious to see what you guys say, because I don't have the firsthand experience. Right, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, definitely from what I've heard from other people, that is is definitely true. Um, what I noticed in terms of the difference between my undergrad, uh, which was not here, and then my master's at Oxford, is that this is a lot more based on independent learning. And, you know, so obviously you are still followed. You've got a tutor, you've got usually like a college advisor or something similar. But really, a lot of it comes down to you and, you know, to how you want to schedule time, which which can be great because, you know, you have a lot of flexibility. And, you know, if there's one week where for whatever reason you can't work, it's it's fine. Like, you know, you can catch up. But it also means you need to be, you know, quite good at scheduling stuff and at motivating yourself to keep doing things throughout the year. Yeah, I definitely agree with Luca. I think that you have to be on top of your work and have that sense of like autonomy and independence in terms of managing your workload. But I think that my undergraduate degree, especially because I studied environment and development, it, it tr helped me transition more towards environmental policy. And I found that transition relatively easier. So academically, I'm finding it OK so, so far. Um, but then there's obviously things that you need to you know keep on top of and I think if you've, you know, sort of mastered that sort of balance, you you don't find it that difficult. Okay, hey, great. And what would you say your most challenging class at university has been and how did you get through it? Uh, I think my most challenging class, I, I just finished it this term, was Portuguese historical linguistics. Uh, because when you do linguistics and a um, a language, you have to do the historical bit. And it was quite, in theory, an interesting mix of both data and just like general analysis. Uh, so what I found challenging about it was uh, kind of being able to write an essay that both analyzes data as well as has that a bit of that literary thrill, uh, thrill so it's easier to read. Um, so I, I found that a bit difficult because you get to write literature essays in my subject and there you can kind of go into what you think the author uh, meant and it's a little bit more creative or there's just pure data analysis where you just get a sample from a language and they tell you what phonological processes are happening here. Um, and I qu quite like both of these things separately, but it was quite difficult to put them together. But during the tutorials, I just got I just got feedback every week and I try to incorporate it, um, which, again, was quite challenging at the beginning. But at one point I did get the hang of it. So and I think it will be quite useful potentially in the future to be able to write something that reads well, but is also quite technical. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that was the most challenging thing. That sounds really tough, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, congrats for finishing that. Uh, I think for me, um, 
this being a two years master's uh, in my first year, I had to take a research methods class, which was meant to prepare you for field work. Uh, and I found the section on, that was on quantitative research methods really, really tough for me. Uh, it involved a lot of coding because, you know, you need to use ma mainly R software to code kind of big data sets and things like that. Uh, I'd never done coding before. I'm not particularly, you know, a tech person in any way. Uh, so I definitely sort of uh, struggle with that. It also did help that we had weekly kind of uh, classes with like a doctor students who would, you know, go really into depth in the coding bits and help us go through anything that we didn't manage to do on our own. So, you know, we got through it, but uh, yeah, definitely challenging because it was completely new for me. I'm actually doing a course on environmental law, which I'm finding pretty challenging because I think navigating legal jargon and, you know, having to um, look at articles and different like agreements is something I've never done before. Uh, I've never done course in law in my undergrad. So I think it's challenging in a way that I'm, I'm definitely learning more about how to approach environmental law. And I think that sort of experience has been um, enriching, a bit challenging, but enriching nonetheless. Um, but I have had uh, supervisions every week, um, which Cambridge offers, uh, where you can talk to your tutors and get help on um, the, the topics of the week. So that's been very helpful so far. So yeah. Amazing. My next question was actually related to that. You all mentioned um, some form of like tutorials or tutors. So I want to ask what is like the tutorial system like? Is there, in, do you think there's enough support from tutors? You think that if you're stuck, there is always some help that you can um, ask for? Um, what has been your experience with that? Uh, so in Oxford, uh, you get a tutor who's kind of in charge of taking care of you specifically. So they might be from your college. And um, I once had a situation where I had to stay at home longer. It was like in the middle of term. Um, and I just emailed her and um, she informed all of my other tutors, which I wasn't able to do at the time, that um, I just won't be in for the week and then we, I could push around certain deadlines. So there's definitely support there. And in terms of tutorials, like academic wise, um, I, th I think it's, it's quite unique that you get to just sit with an expert and quite a small group. In my case, the groups were really quite small sometimes because I am the only person doing the combination of subjects. So it was just me and the tutor, which may sound very scary. And I thought it would be, but it ended up not being scary at all because if I didn't understand something then they were there to explain it to me. And I think when you have smaller groups, it gives you the confidence to actually ask the questions that you want to ask. Because when you have a class of 30 people, I would never put my hand up. Um, so I think it's very good because it feels very tailored to you and you do feel like you're getting the support um, you need um, just to do well because that's where they're, that's what they're there for and they mark your essays every week and they want to see you improve. Um, so I think in terms of that, the support really is there. Yeah, uh, definitely agree on the, on the first part. I think the college structure really helps with that. You know, colleges are relatively small, so you get kind of like very personalized <laughs> support. Um, and in terms of the academic side, yes, I also, I mean, let me yeah echo that. Uh, I think the other good thing that comes out of it for me is that, um, as Susanna was saying, we have like very small classes. I had one where it was, you know, me, another student and the professor. And so you get to develop quite like a friendly, uh, intimate relationship with the professor in a, you know, in a really good way to the point where at the end of the class, he just invited us over for lunch, you know, and that's something I would have never done, certainly not back home in Italy. Uh, where you know there's a bit more of a formal distance um so yeah it was you know it was fun and and you really get to see them uh as almost as friends sometimes i definitely agree with everyone else um at cambridge uh they're called supervisions rather than tutorials they're called supos uh and they're quite informal little discussions where uh, you have sort of PhD teachers and then they sort of teach um, us on specific topics of the week. So if we did it, I did a recent one where we had a debate about like voluntary carbon market. So that was very interesting to have this sort of like session away from just formal lectures and do these activities with um, other students. It definitely helps with your learning and understanding of the topic. So yeah, I, I found those very useful and I think um going to those have really have helped my sort of exp academic experience. 
Okay, um, amazing. And throughout your like time at Oxford or Cambridge, have you had any internships or work experience? Was this um, something that you are looking forward to doing or maybe you have done? Um, is there any help that maybe the university provides with uh, finding work experience? Um, what has been you know, your experience with that uh, whole thing? Uh, so I did I did quite a few things. So two two years ago, I was a student ambassador at my college. So I helped uh, pupils from UK schools um, see what it's like to be at Oxford and help them a little bit with the application system. So that's something that, that students can do um, every year, I think from the second year onwards. Um, so that's quite a nice opportunity. And I did uh, I got a few other opportunities outside of Oxford. So, for example, I did a internship um, with Reuters News. I worked on the German team um, there for three months um, where I did do a little bit of translation. So what I studied at Oxford did, did help quite a lot. Um, now I freelance in teaching children English. Uh, I teach Polish children English, um, which... Um, is is quite rewarding and it's a nice thing to do um, on the side. And Oxford has a career service. Uh, so I'm also right now slowly on the lookout for a job. Um, so uh, they've got a great support there. You can schedule a meeting with an officer who will help you uh, like kind of decide what you want to go into. They have a micro internship a scheme, which I also just applied for. Um, so there's there's quite a lot of opportunities and support um, in that in that regard. Yeah, I think uh, exactly. I mean, and you mentioned the micro internship scheme. I think that's what I wanted to uh, yeah, just highlight because I think it's quite useful the way they run it at Oxford. So it's through the career service. And basically, they're like very short internships. You know, sometimes it's just one week, maybe two, uh, I think max three weeks that are during the breaks. Uh, and yeah, I just find that quite nice because obviously managing an internship alongside like your studies during term, that can get a lot quite quickly. Uh, so it's good that they have these kind of shorter opportunities uh, over the break where you can just kind of like, you know, take a couple of weeks out to try out something new, see how you like it. And you kind of, you know, get a foot through the door in a way. Uh, and so, you know, it might come in handy when you graduate afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, I think those are quite valuable. I, I did one and it was I really enjoyed it. It was rewarding. Um, at Cambridge uh, last term, I did a small internship slash consulting project where I was working on developing an ESC strategy for a firm. So that was um, my experience of an internship. But I know that there's many other students getting actively involved within internships and part time positions, both within Cambridge and also outside of Cambridge. Uh, there's also just roles that you can do um, within your college. You can be uh, working with your college to be, for example, like an entertainment officer or a welfare officer. So that's an opportunity that you can consider to be part of. And then also Cambridge offers a career service, which is very, very um, helpful. They, off, um, they do sort of monthly career fairs and networking events where you can talk to recruiters. They come and um, they sort of promote their company and you can just have um, discussions with them, formal discussions. And I think that's been a very invaluable source so far because I'm also been searching for jobs. And I think that having a sort of um, career service like that is very useful. Amazing. That's great to hear that there is a lot of help available for um, those who might require it. Um, so moving on to a bit of like how you got here. So what, what would you say the application process was like? So you can, of course, Susanna, you can answer from like an undergrad perspective and Luca and Lubica, you can answer from a master's perspective. So I want to see if there's a difference and what is uh, the process like? Is it very different from other universities? Um, what has been your experience with this? I think the main thing to note is how early the application process starts. So whereas other universities, I believe the process could start even like January or something like that. Um, with Oxbridge, um, it is October. So you kind of have to be, I think it's October or, no or November, quite early anyway. So you have to be ready with your personal statement. Um, you have to have um, made sure that your predicted grades are quite, quite good. 
Um, and then there are quite a few stages to it. And I think as an international student, it all felt like there was quite a lot of them because some of them involve travel. So first, um, there's the UCAS bit <clears throat> with the personal statements and predicted grades. And then um, the admissions test, which in my case were two tests, um, half an hour each. Um, and uh, that was quite interesting because I had never done the subjects that I applied for at school. Um, so they were kind of, they didn't expect me to have prior knowledge, but they tested the way that I approach problems, um, which I thought was quite quite handy because they, they see if you will be able to succeed in the subject rather than whether you're kind of ready to already know things about the subject. Um, and then there were the interviews, uh, which I had in person. I know I think all of them now have moved to online, um, but at the time uh, you would come to Oxford and have those interviews. And then I believe around January or February, I got an offer. And then it's up to you. Um, you have to do your exams and see whether you meet the offer or not. And then you are welcomed into Oxford. So it's quite a lengthy process. And I think coming from abroad, it seemed like so, so much. Because uh, when you apply to Poland, you do that around May or June um, before starting your academic year. And it's just you send off one application and that's it. So I think when you're applying to Oxford, just be ready a little bit earlier and know that there are quite a few a few steps that you have to go to. So it kind of keeps you on your toes for quite a few months. Right. Yeah. Um, so the master's one, I think, is slightly different. It's maybe a bit more similar to uh, just usually, you know, kind of other universities in the UK for master's, because uh, for me, there was no interview process, which is what in the undergrad case kind of, you know, distinguishes Oxford from everyone else. Uh, I, I think the thing I can say almost for certain is that what they cared about in my application, because it's a it's a three year master's by research, is sort of your research proposal. You know, it didn't have to be like a definite kind of very clear plan, but uh, they definitely, I think, wanted to see, you know, an idea of where you'd like to head in terms of research, what kind of themes you're looking at, um, and if there are professors in the faculty that could, you know, supervise you and be a good fit for that. Uh, so, yeah, for me, that was the biggest thing to kind of uh, consider throughout my application process, like put together a coherent kind of proposal for what I'd like to do and make sure that there is someone in my faculty that uh, would work well with it. Yeah, I think um, uh, for my pro application process, it was very similar. I had no interview. I just had to write a personal statement, which was, I think, one of the most important parts of your application for sure, and uh, references and also a small research proposal um, with a uh, provisional dissertation title and uh, which supervisor you plan to um, be with. And yeah, I think that uh, having already applied for UK universities for my undergrad, I think the experience of writing a personal statement was pretty similar, definitely it's more academic focused. So that's um, an important thing to consider. Um, it plays a huge weightage in your application. And also for references, it was a pretty easy uh, process. Just had to ask my professors um, from my undergraduate degree. And um, yeah, I think uh, there's there were two deadlines for Cambridge. There was an earlier decision and also just the regular decision. So I applied for early, which was so that, that meant I had to submit my application by December. And um, the, uh, the later one was, I think, by March. So I think, um, as Susanna said, it's very important to be on top and just uh, of your deadlines and make sure you have everything on time. And yeah. Hey, amazing. I think some very um, interesting uh, and useful advice there. Um, so moving on to a bit more of lifestyle at your university. So um, let's start with accommodation. Um, as, you know, international students, what has the accommodation process been like? Was it easy to find? Does the university help you? Are there is there more of like a dormitory situation? Um, so what has that process been like? 
Uh, so in my case, I'm at Wadham College. So every every college has their own uh, student accommodation. And my college provides on-site accommodation for two years of your degree, which means that you live where the college is. Um, and then for the other, in my case, two years, they provide accommodation that's outside of the main site, but it still belongs to Wadham, which I think is is really good because you get to live with other people from your college um so uh especially in uh, i started during covid so the people that i lived with uh were the basically the only people i could see um and it was great because we were all at the same year we had some different experiences because we were from different backgrounds um but we could also kind of relate to each other quite nicely and uh, so i think i think it's 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 good of course you have the option to live out um, and uh, rent a place somewhere else. But what a student accommodation gives you is like the comfort of not having to worry about certain bills. You just kind of pay the college and you're happy. And you also get to live with people who are doing the same thing as you, but in different subjects. So overall, I, th I think my experience with accommodation has has been quite, quite good. Um, I don't think there's, uh, I haven't really heard anyone being too upset about their accommodation, um, especially the ones in on main site, uh, because they're just in the center and you've got everything is very close because Oxford is quite small. So basically, wherever you live, it's you're not going to have to walk more than 25 minutes to get anywhere. Um, so I think that's that's been quite quite handy as an undergrad and just starting out to have friends from the get go. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, as Susanna said, all the, I mean, I think, you know, 80, 90% of accommodation is kind of college owned and uh, run. Uh, I do think there's some that are like kind of run by the Central University, but, you know, most likely you will be housed in your college. Uh, I, I'm at St. Anthony's. I also think that I'm not 100% sure, but I think for most uh, first year students coming in, uh, there is guaranteed accommodation. Um, Anthony's is a bit more kind of, dispersed than maybe what them is so not all of them will be on site but i think you are guaranteed to have college housing and yeah as Susanna said it's a good way to meet people um it's definitely one of the nicest part and it's also nice because yeah you don't have to worry about kind of you know landlords and tenancy agreements and how long the things are and the bills and the wi-fi's and all of those uh so they can they can be i think quite uh convenient and then i think for the second year or for your third year if you're a doctor student uh, then you're not guaranteed accommodation. You can apply for it, but it's, you won't necessarily get it. So then you might need to look kind of um, elsewhere around around the area for private housing. Yeah, I think I've had very um, different experiences to you both because I live in private accommodation. So um, I'm at Wolfson at Cambridge and the college is um, around 40 minutes away from the city centre, so quite far. And um, it's a mature college, so um, mature students are not guaranteed accommodation. So I thought for me, having already lived in student accommodation in my undergrad for three years, I, was, I wasn't too fussed about not living in student accommodation again. So I chose to go private. Um, and I think also Cambridge has an amazing accommodation service as well, um, where they have private listings for um, apartments and rooms that are available for students um, to live in. And it's... Uh, for me, I've had a positive experience with private. I know a lot of people don't. Um, there's issues with the bills and landlords it's quite, and tenancies, which is quite complicated. For me, it's been all right so far. So, um, But I think that if you're looking for a good college experience and wanting to live on site in um, your college, I think definitely do go for student accommodation if your college um, offers it. I think there's uh, more opportunity to get involved with your college and you know meet new people in that way so yeah okay and what about like university clubs and societies what has been your experience with that is there are there any societies that you joined at um your university um maybe uh whether it was a hobby one or one that helped you develop your academic in interests so what is the like club society scene like at oxford and cambridge so there are loads of clubs and societies here. I think there's even one that's like hummus enthusiast society. There's everything. Um, so I joined one uh, 
I joined the Tolkien Society because I'm a fan of fantasy. Um, and that's been great. And I also got to be involved with the committee. So I was publicity officer for that. And it's just, it, it feels very homey. It's just you and you and your people who share the same passion, um, uh, sharing it with others. Um, so I think there are so many possibilities. And also something I think is very important for international students, you get the like country societies. So I'm, I go to Polish society events, which I think it's, it's always nice to know that there are people from your country with the same background as you, who you can kind of share your experiences with. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I've had quite a good experience with, with societies and clubs. I've been to a few like one-off uh, events, um, met some people, decided whether it was my thing. And then if not, I just moved on and could easily find a different alternative. So I think whether you're looking for something academic, you can join like a debate club or uh, there's philosophy ones. I'm quite sure there's like maths people who like to just sit and talk about maths, or you can go to a sci-fi one, or you can, um, I think there's a cheese and wine society. There's anything I, I think you, you'd think of. So I, I highly recommend just experimenting with that uh, because you can really find interesting people there and people you might stay in touch for the rest of your degree with. Yeah, the wine and cheese society is good. I can I can attest to that. Um, right, yeah, I mean, and in general, yeah, as you said, uh, there's loads and loads of options. Um, so so many different things, you know, sports, things like that. Um, the the definitely the country societies are are a good way to kind of sometimes you know meet people from back home and just like you know sometimes it's nice to kind of like speak Italian in my case and things like that. Um, the other one I I joined, which is college based, is rowing. Um, I just I just thought, you know, it's a very stereotypical Ox Oxbridge thing. Uh, why not give it a go? Um, I don't do it competitively. Um, there's a sort of Oxford University rowing team, which is, you know, the really good one. And they go on to kind of uh, to then row against Cambridge. I think also against the London Uni. Uh, that's really intense. You know, it's a big training schedule. I'm sure it's really rewarding, but it, it takes a lot. Uh, the college-based ones are usually a bit more relaxed um and yeah so you know i enjoy that it's it's something you don't get to do in i mean elsewhere in general i would say uh so that's been that's been fun yeah and you can also as i said get involved with the committees if you want kind of you know extra uh involvement in it uh and that can also be a good way to kind of bond and yeah just do something nice for the community yeah, very similar to Oxford. I think Cambridge also just has a lot of opportunities to be part of many societies. Um, I think there's over 200, if I'm not mistaken. So there's, you know, there's a lot of room to explore, try new things. Um, I think for me, living um, outside of the college, I, I try to capitalize on societies and going um, into some of the events. I've been doing more academic ones. So I'm part of um, a Cambridge consulting network. So we do like consulting projects, but I've also been part of um, Cambridge Zero, which is um, this sort of like um, climate initiative to go net zero. Um, Cambridge's response to that, they've been doing some very cool events. Um, they've organized the students um, to go for COP28 recently. So that was very exciting. So there's there's a lot going on. And I think that also um, there's uh, things like rowing you can do, um, a lot of sports. So definitely it, it makes a lot of your unique experience to try out these things and meet new people. And it's it's a break from all the academic work. So definitely, definitely vouch for joining societies. <laughs> Amazing. And in terms of campus life, have you guys visited other campuses? And how do you think that compared to your universities, maybe um, like Luca and Malvika, you can talk about comparison to your undergrad at unis. What is the difference that, you know, sets Oxford or Cambridge apart from other unis in terms of maybe campus life? Uh, I will just say that um, I think everyone's quite close together. So I think both Oxford and Cambridge are quite small. So it's easier to meet people, but I will um, pass the question on to the masters. Um, right, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I went to Manchester for my undergrad. Um, and yeah, I mean, definitely quite different. I think uh, probably, yeah, uh, I hope you will agree. It's the, the thing that makes the most difference is the college system. 
because definitely here is everything is about the colleges is around the colleges whereas uh Manchester didn't have colleges so you know it was just the broader university um it was a it was a campus university whereas also this kind of uh, throughout the city um so yeah I mean in some ways it's it's a lot smaller it's a lot more intimate uh you really really get to know the people around your college uh and that's where most of my social life has has been whereas I think when I was at Manchester it was more about the people I met on my course uh so you know it'd be people I met uh, lectures tutorials things like that and then you kind of yeah you know obviously you make friends through that and go on and do other things uh whereas yeah here it's just a lot more kind of restricted to your your college and sometimes if you don't make uh kind of a conscious effort through clubs and societies it's actually quite hard to meet people from other colleges just because you know yeah everything is so based around it uh, Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said. I mean, having come from London, which is a pretty big city, and living there for three years, the transition to Cambridge was definitely different. <laughs> uh, very interesting for me. Uh, I think Cambridge is very small, at, at least my... um, it, And in, like, London, I mean, it wasn't a campus university. LSE isn't one, but it was in the it's city centre, so you get access to everything. And I think Cambridge is like that, but much smaller <laughs> and uh i think there's um it's it's definitely different for me and it's been something that i've been getting used to but i i've been liking it so far i um have had the chance to go around the different colleges visiting them and also just meeting new people in the process and i think that it's it's been it's been a nice change and also cuz cambridge is so small you just always keep running into people that you know so that you can just imagine how small it is <laughs> for that to happen so it's definitely a transition but something that has been positive okay yeah, amazing and in terms of i think oxford versus cambridge what like from each of you what do you think are the main differences between them like why should students choose one over the over the other are like is one university better for certain subjects is one better for certain sports so what what do you think like differentiates them what which one is better in what aspect i say so this is this is quite a difficult question at least for me because i don't have that much experience with cambridge but one thing that i i've heard that hasn't I've, i haven't been told that it's wrong is that Obviously, both Oxford and Cambridge have humanities and STEM subjects, but I have heard that Cambridge is a little bit more tailored to those STEM subjects, whereas Oxford is tailored to the humanities subject. I mean, they're both doing quite well <laughs> in both regards, but the, I heard that, um, for example, there was um, one friend of mine who was considering going either Oxford or Cambridge for maths, and he decided to go with Cambridge because of the reputation it has for maths. Um, other than that, uh, I mean, obviously, there's like the um, apparent rival, rival, rivalry that we have, um, which I, I don't think if there are actual foundations for that, uh, other than just being uh, on the top um, sometimes. But um, I think in, in general, uh, I think both both universities do most subjects well, but I have heard that Cambridge is more STEMI and Oxford is more uh, humanities based. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's the general idea. Yeah, that's also what I heard. Um, I think I can really only speak in terms of my uh, kind of master's experience. And in that regard, they are, I mean, absolutely equal, you know, yeah, there is, there is a supposed rivalry and things like that. But really, I mean, uh, the Latin American Center at Oxford you know, often hosts kind of speakers or students from uh, the the kind of the sister Latin American center uh, center at Cambridge, and I mean, yeah, I would say you know absolutely equal in in many ways in in the way the course is structured, in the things you learn and stuff like that. So really, if kind of if you have to choose, for me, it came down to a specific member of faculty that I wanted to work with. That's what made the difference. But I mean, otherwise, I would have been completely happy with the. Uh, either or I mean yeah yeah I think the main differences between Oxford and Cambridge come from the courses that are offered and the, the city itself I mean 
for my master's, I applied to both Oxford and Cambridge. So I know you can't do that in undergrad, but in master's you can because you apply directly to the university. And, you know, I the reason why I stuck with Cambridge is because I just prefer the course more. Um, the one um, the one at Cambridge looks at um, law, economics and policy, which wasn't um, offered at Oxford. So I just that's the reason why I like the Cambridge one better. And I think also in terms of the city, um, I think there's a saying that goes around as like Oxford is a town with the uni attached and then Cambridge is a uni with a town attached. The, I think the whole city of Cambridge is revolved around the university and I think Oxford is slightly bigger and more livelier. So those are the sort of differences between them. So I think it just comes down to personal preferences. If you have the opportunity, go visit both of them. That's what I did. And I sort of realized I would, I was more inclined towards Cambridge. I just enjoyed it more. I could see myself there. And also just look at the courses, if look at the syllabus, what what's offered, because I know there's very diff two different styles of teaching within Oxford and Cambridge, and maybe you might prefer one or the other. So do your research, and I think that, that should help. Okay, amazing. Very interesting. And um, moving on, you always hear like sometimes about, you know, interesting traditions that both of these schools have. So in your experience, ha have, have there been any weird or interesting traditions that your university has that you've maybe experienced? Like whether in social life or even like academic, anything? So I th I think there are quite a lot. I think as as a Polish person, I I think the general um, image that Polish people have of students in Oxford is like they they wear the outfits all the time, like the subfusks we call them. So like the little capes with the we only wear them for exams. Um, but it is it is also quite quite interesting to see just like a, a wave of people dressed exactly the same going into like fancy buildings to to write their exams. Um, so I think that that's just kind of I, I can I put it in the fun category rather than the kind of weird category. Um, but there there are I think there is one celebration at one of the one of the colleges that I'm not entirely sure what it's about, but I think they drink port wine and they walk backwards in a circle in Merton to celebrate a certain thing. Um, so there I think colleges have different different traditions for example at Wadham um, there is a thing called queer fest so that's where the LGBTQ community is celebrated and we just have there's a huge concert they invite a lot of different artists and it's just all very colorful and fun and we also do Wadstock which is like Woodstock but at Wadham um, so every every college has has their own traditions um, but yeah, you do kind of get the stereotype of people on bicycles in in white shirts and and capes. Uh, so that does happen. Uh, but other than that, I think a lot of it is just fun. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I, I'm sure there's lots of like college based ones that, you know, I don't know <laughs> um, from other colleges and they, they must be really fun ones. Uh, I think I don't know if it counts as a tradition, but like the, the kind of thing I can think of to link it back to my um, rowing experience is that um, there is an annual kind of race between the different like colleges, uh, which is on the Thames. Uh, and I think there's a certain style of racing, uh, which is only allowed in Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and it's where the aim of the race is not to arrive first, but to bump the boat in front of you. Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's it's odd, it's unique. There's lots of people that come to watch it. Um, and yeah, it's fun and you can't get it uh, anywhere else. So it's definitely one of these little kind of quirky historical things that, you know, stayed from centuries back uh, and remain today. Yeah, I think there's a good mix of like some weird quirky ones, but also just some really fun ones. I know that there's um, May week at Cambridge where um, after just exams, because we don't do reading weeks like um, other UK universities where we get a week off of the term, we just have the straight eight weeks. So they do um, things like May balls, garden parties and events. And I think that's very, very fun and interesting. And um, but then there's also some quirky ones for sure. I know that after the May week, there's um, a Cambridge boat race, I think, where they do a boat race, but the weird part is that the boat is made of cardboard. 
I don't know how this works. <laughs> I, I don't know the logistics behind it, but uh, that's a sort of weird tradition that I've heard about. But I think there's there's quite some interesting ones. I know there's some college specific ones as well. Okay, amazing. And there's a question here, but I think like we sort of covered about, you know, you mentioned what subjects are maybe better at Oxford, which ones are better at Cambridge. So I'll, um, I'll alter the question a bit and ask uh, about what the exact like format of your classes and lectures were, because you mentioned that may, that is something that might be a bit different between Oxford and Cambridge. So can you describe like a typical structure of your classes and lectures, both from like the class structure to even how like uh, assignments are graded, whether it's based on exams or quizzes or more debate style. So can you describe a typical structure of your classes, lectures? assignments, essentially. So in my case, this will differ a lot between the first year and the next years, because in, in the first year, everyone does the same thing. I mean, of course, um, according to subject. Uh, but in second year and for the rest of uh, your course, you can choose specific subjects. So for example, in first year in linguistics, I had a few tutorials in every possible subject. So I had some historical linguistics, sociolinguistics, psycho, um, phon phonology. Um, and then at the uh, end of first year, you get to choose your options. So for example, I chose phonetics and phonology, semantics and pragmatics. So I'm doing, um, and you usually have eight tutorials per subject, um, which means that you usually have eight essays to submit, and these could be split between terms. So a uh, term is eight weeks. Um, it's usually not advised to have all eight tutorials within the same term because you have other stuff going on, which I'll talk about in a second. So they're usually every two weeks, like your essay tutorials. So you can complete a subject anywhere between in two terms, in one and a half terms. Um, and then most of the things you do are preparation for the exam. I mean, it's everything is useful for the exam, but uh, you get to just write essays in in my in my case. And on a weekly basis, um, I've got um, I'm doing semantics and pragmatics this term. So I've got one to twenty five hundred word essay per week um, and I've got the Portuguese stuff. So I've got an oral presentation, um, a translation to do either from Portuguese into English or from English into Portuguese. Uh, and I've got one essay to write for Portuguese, which is like 500, 600 words. And that's basically what I have to do every week. Um, and again, that will change depending on how many, um, subjects you're doing. So you may be doing a literature paper in one term, you may be doing a grammar uh, paper the next term. So that is what will change. But usually when you have subjects, uh, not subject, when you do languages, uh, you will have like a constant set of classes that you will have, which will involve translation, listening, speaking, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, interesting yeah, to hear that. And it's for me, it's kind of weird. Some things are very similar. Some things are very, very different. Um, so uh, my my course is over two years. Um, terms are also eight weeks. Uh, you take different uh, classes every term. You have to finish them within the term. So we cannot split it, uh, as you said, over kind of, you know, two terms or more, or more even. Uh, so you have to do your eight tutorials in one kind of consecutive term. Um, we don't have an essay every week. I would say it's usually maybe every two weeks, sometimes every three weeks. Um, but the idea is, I think the tutorials are, are a bit different. There are small groups, but they will give you an assigned set of readings before. Uh, these, you know, vary hugely in length. Uh, sometimes it's like 60 pages and you're fine. Sometimes it's 300 and you're not fine. Um, but the idea is you'll get there, you'll discuss it with your tutor, with the other, the other students. Um, you try, you know, and kind of, yeah, get to the core of the, of the issues that you're grappling with, uh, Sometimes you'll write an essay on it, sometimes not. Sometimes you'll have like a presentation. And then the assessment is usually uh, you write like a long essay. So that would be 5,000 words over the break after the term where you've done that subject. So in the first term, the, the kind of autumn one, uh, you know, for example, I did uh, a class on the Catholicism in Latin America. Um, and then over that break, kind of the, the winter vacation, I wrote something, turned it in just before this term started, and that's what I will get uh, assessed on and graded on.
Yeah, my experience is very similar to Luca's. Um, so I do four modules and two of them run across uh, the whole year. And then I just have two that I can choose um, just for the specific term. I have supervisions for um, the class. I have lectures, which are two hours uh, each week. And then I also have the supervisions for the class, which are not every week. Um, you can sign up to them if you want to do them or not. Um, and they're just um, just an opportunity to learn more about the subject. There's, uh, like I mentioned, I did a debate. There's also presentations that you can give. There's also doing essays or just written tasks. So there's a quite varied mix of assignments that they ask for, unlike just an essay every week. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting. And uh, then we just have exams uh, over Christmas. And uh, it's, I've had a mix of five hour exams so they're all they're all online for me and uh, I've also done 48 hour exams and I've also done an assignment which is the 4,000 word project so a good mix of different kind of things but it's been relatively good so far. Sorry, I just forgot to say about the assessment because it's completely different. Um, so in my case, uh, in first year, after first year, you do a thing called prelims. So these are exams that you take um, based on everything you, you've you done in first year. And there you do get a grade for that, but it's basically just about you getting into second year where you will be able to choose options. And then... Um, uh, later you um, you do all the assignments and sometimes the the tutor will give you an indication of how how you would be graded for it in an exam setting um but it's not like there's there's a book where all the grades go into um so in my case i will just have exams in may you can do a dissertation which obviously like oh, you can substitute an exam for a dissertation um but in my case like really the thing that will matter will be those uh, exams in in may so i do get an indication of how i would be graded but nothing really happens with those grades which on the one hand is really nice because you you get the feeling that you can make mistakes um uh, on the other some subjects also do collections so those are um exams that you can do before term starts um some subjects require that um and they just kind of test knowledge from previous terms again those grades don't really go anywhere but they're an indication to you of how you're doing yeah sorry that's it no, that's great. Amazing. Really interesting. Um, so we're coming towards the end of our panel now. So before we end, I wanted to ask if there was any, you know, piece of advice you would give yourself if you could go back to before you came to Oxford or Cambridge or anything you wish you knew, maybe something to make your application better or something about your life at university now that you, um, you know, would advise your younger self on, uh, what would it be? I think there's one thing that I'm still teaching myself, uh, trying to, is that regardless of how much luck you have in life, you are a part of the success that you achieve. So I, uh, there were quite a few situations in my life where um, I was very lucky. And at one point when a big thing happens, like getting into Oxford, I just kind of boiled everything down to, oh, I was just lucky. But it's not luck that will write your personal statement for you. It's not luck that's going to give you good predicted grades. So just kind of realize that you really have a say in all of this. So like, yes, obviously, you are, you are going to be unlucky sometimes. But I think especially in these in these universities, it's important to go in with some self-esteem because you will kind of feel like an imposter sometimes just because of the way all of this works and also the pressure of everyone having a certain reaction when you say you go to Oxbridge and you can't really fight that, but you can kind of tell yourself that this success is yours and you can be proud of yourself even if you don't get in and even if you do anything that happens, you can just realize that it's not just luck. Everything good that happens also is thanks to you. So I'm still teaching myself that because it's sometimes difficult. Uh, but I think that's something that I could have started teaching myself a little bit sooner and realized that I have a say in everything that happens to me. That's yeah, that's really nice. Um... I think I'll be quite cheesy and just my advice is go for what you like. Uh, 
you know, it's something you hear all the time. I'm sure <laughs> you've been you've been told that much too often. Uh, but I do I do stand by that. And I mean, you know, um <laughs> some of my friends, you know, jokingly will point out that uh a master's in Latin American studies, you know, what career do you go into with that? Um, you know, there's there's a lot more options that one realizes beforehand. Um, and you know, things do come your way. Um so I would say if you are passionate about something, if you really enjoy it, uh go for it. Yes, you know, don't not everyone needs to do law or medicine or these kind of like clearly, you know, career oriented things. Do what obviously if that's what you enjoy, go for it. But yeah, go for what really uh, speaks to what you want to do. And then kind of like, you know, opportunities will arise. Uh definitely. So yeah. I think I have like two pieces of advice that I would give myself. I think um firstly for the application process um I think planning and organizing your time making sure that you have enough time to write the statement is very important um I didn't leave my statement till last minute but I think I definitely would have had an advantage if I took my time and I wrote it a bit more because I was feeling kind of pressurized towards the end to finish it off and send it before the deadline and I think that statement is really reflective of you as a person your interest and why you want to um, uh, be part of this university so I think just making sure that that you've nailed that in the head and you've, you've really shown to them that you are interested in this course and how you would contribute um, to the course is very important so take your time with that and then secondly um, when you're here um, in either Oxford or Cambridge I think just make the most out of your experience uh, for me being a master's student I only have like one year to take make the most out of Cambridge and I'm still there's so much yet to discover and I'm I'm, I'm going to be graduating in summer so I think that I really should have just made the most out of it um join societies um be part of your college's events things like that make new friends do things that you like explore new th challenges it's, it's there's just a lot of things going on so that would be my advice Amazing, really, really great advice there. Um, before we end, there's another uh, question in the chat here. So someone is asking, can I only send one, send an application to one subject? For instance, can I send one application for medicine and another one for history? And I also wanted to ask whether I should include include the fact that I went to Cambridge for summer school and my score from that in my application. So I'm not sure I can answer the second bit, but in terms of this, the first part, uh, yeah, I could only apply to one subject um, and I could only apply either to Oxford or to Cambridge. So that meant that my personal statement could be really tailored to the subject because you you just don't have any other options. So that's why what Luca said is so important that go for what you like, because they will see in the personal statement if that is just one that you use for every single application. Um, uh, so yeah, so it was just just one subject for me. I think for masters you can apply to different subjects. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's you know a limit to that or if you can do just as many as you want. Uh, obviously each application requires a lot of work, so that's you know that's the only kind of uh yeah thing I'll be consider of because you need to do different personal statements. As Susanna said, you want them to be tailored, you want them to be very specific. So, you know, yeah, bear in mind that that's going to take quite a lot, but I, I'm sure you can apply to more. And in terms of including your summer school, I think I potentially from what I know, I would include it. I think, you know, if it's relevant to what you're applying for, uh, it makes sense to put it there. Um, not sure if, you know, not, not sure if that's going to, if that's the thing that's going to give you an edge, but it, it, it definitely won't hurt, I think, to put it down. Yeah, I think, you should definitely put it down um, because I had a friend who also did um, summer school in Cambridge and who's now in Cambridge. But I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the only factor in her application for sure. There's many other things, but it's a valuable experience. And if you've learned, if you've developed transferable skills that you can sort of reflect on in your statement, I think definitely it doesn't hurt to put that in. And um, for the question about the uh, uh, if you can send an application to one subject or other, I think you can do that at Cambridge.
Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of our panel now. Um, so I think, you know, amazing advice is really insightful and helpful for those who are thinking about going uh, or attending Oxford or Cambridge. I think you've all uh, given some pretty inspiring uh, advice and, uh, you know, tips uh, for applications as well. And also, you know, given a lot of insight into uh, what it's like to study and live at these universities. So for everyone out there, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact our panelists um, on LinkedIn. But we've come to the end of our panel now. So I want to say a massive thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking some time out of your day to watch the panel. And especially a massive, massive thank you to our panelists for giving us your um, invaluable advice. Uh, so once again, for everyone out there, if you're interested in more panels like this, with mentors who have already been on the journey you're about to embark on in terms of universities and careers. You can find out more information on our website and socials. But that is it for today. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your Saturday. Goodbye.